The next deputant is uh, Lindsay Galloway, followed by Paul Gallet and, uh, and, and Dr. Andre Ng. Please go ahead. Good morning. Good morning. Five minutes. Good morning. It's good to be here talking about animals and the future of animals. Any day that you get to do that is a good day. It's what I get to do a lot of. I'm Lindsay Galloway. I'm a senior director with the Calgary Zoo, where my responsibilities include education of park visitors as well as education of, of school age kids. And I can tell you on our zoo today, it will be absolutely packed with school children. I'm also vice president of Canada's accredited zoos and aquariums. Uh, and within CASA, I'm the chair of the Ethics and Compliance Committee. So thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, about uh, your considerations about bylaw changes regarding prohibited animals and, and programming. I'm here representing, as I say, CASA's 32 accredited zoos and aquariums. Uh, by, ba by way of background, if you're not aware of CASA, we've provided information. That th what distinguishes the 32 accredited members is our adherence to an accredited accreditation system that increasingly has setting, it is setting some of the strongest standards for animal welfare in the world. We are currently going through a process of evaluating a comparative to other regulations worldwide, and continuous improvement is, is part of how we operate. This is, uh, this is an important time for the zoo and aquarium industry because it's an important time for the future animals on this planet. At a time when animal populations worldwide are crashing, including here in Canada, and if you don't know, there are 520 Canadian species now listed, listed as at risk of extinction in our own backyard. It's an issue that Canadians painfully are not aware of, and on our 150th birthday, it's an issue that deserves more attention. CASA's members are evolving from simply being exhibitors of animals to becoming advocates for wild, wildlife and wild places. With 12 million animal, annual visitors, it's a CASA member's responsibility, it's the opportunity, it's the responsibility to educate Canadians about the issues and the challenges facing wildlife and the opportunity to make a difference to encourage everyone to become an activist for wildlife. For Canada's most progressive zoos and aquariums, for Canada's endangered wildlife, the status quo is not an option. You'll hear today from lots of people who care deeply about animals and their future. We share that concern. CASA's accreditation is increasingly recognized as a benchmark for quality animal care and welfare in Canada. With governments, we are encouraging governments to recognize at all levels, and I support this group's leadership. I agree with much of what Mike said, Mike Zimmerman said, but leadership is leadership. Action is action, and animals need help now. Regarding the review of, of prohibited animals, CASA recommends that the City of Toronto is leading the way because there's been too little regulation. Absolutely, leadership is what's needed. Uh, however, we don't believe that prohibition will effectively stop the use of prohibited animals in mobile programming, as the city intends. It is important to prohibit certain types of animals from being exhibited this way. Uh, the question is, how do you go about doing it? It, it, what, what this bylaw will do, we believe, will drive an already existing subversive market for prohibited animals further underground. Yes, there are some CASA members who operate in this way, but at least half of the programming that's happening in the city have nothing to do with CASA members. They are not being scrutinized by anybody. The reality is it's not illegal, as you know, to own exotic animals in Ontario, and there's a number of individuals who operate within your city jurisdiction. Uh, who bring animals in for things like birthday parties. They are not respecting current regulations on prohibited animals and likely will dis disregard future changes. Whereas with CASA, we, we focus on, on absolutely respecting the law of the land, the law in the city, and we, of course, will be operating in compliance with whatever bylaw changes you, you uh, implement. But we are encouraging you to be thinking about CASA as a partner in this endeavor. So first of all, I'm here to say, we request that the City of Toronto uh, continue to provide an exception of some, of some fashion for CASA accredited institutions who provide off-site educational programming. That is the best way to keep your eyes on, the, on those who are doing the programming. 
Further, we request that the city go the extra step to require any organization using animals, whether on the prohibitive lifts or not, to have an operating license. The question becomes then, on what basis does a company qualify for a license? And we suggest that demonstrating some kind of compliance, such as with CASA's policies, um, a compliance with CASA's accreditation policies, particularly our use of animals in education programming policy. Please try to wrap up. We believe the requirement should be more stringent oversight for even the film and television industry. In closing, the opportunity here is to make a difference for animals and their future. We believe educational programming is critical of that, and the bylaw changes that you're, you're proposing can make that easier or harder, but what's most important that we share is making sure the animals' welfare are taken consideration. Thank you, Mr. Galloway. Questions? Councillor Fletcher? Uh, yes, I'm just, uh, I believe that CASA supported uh, the establishment of a shelter for exotic animals in Etobicoke. Is that correct? I, I'm not aware of that. And accredited the, uh, accredited them? Do you accredit shelters for exotic animals? Not that I'm aware of. Not that you're aware of? Yeah. Um, so I'm just kangaroos and other things like that, other animals, I shouldn't say things, other animals like that that are uh, in this so-called shelter. Would you be surprised to understand that CASA accredited that you, as a shelter that takes animals out to parties? We absolutely will accredit an organiz any organization that will adhere to the standards that we set for animal welfare and human safety. So then you would agree, you, your organization, CASA, would think that it would be uh, no problem then to have a kangaroo that would be taken out to birthday parties and other places. In the right circumstances. In the right circumstances. Yeah. What would those be? As long as the, the, the welfare of that animal was absolutely paramount, and we, we have standards in our use of animal, ed, animals and education programming that spell out in detail what, that, uh, what the expectations are, that policy has been shared with this committee. I see, I see it here. And would it be okay with CASA to have a flamingo standing in a pie plate with a little water in it? Is that, just these are practices these are, I've witnessed. Right, and I can't speak to what you may have saw. I'm just what asking you. It's hard to it's hard to tell, you know, in terms of what you're describing, the circumstances. Well, how about a flamingo in the middle here in a pie plate with a little water standing there all day? Is that a standard that would meet your unlikely? Or unlikely. Unlikely. And a kangaroo in a small cage out in here sitting there all day. Is that a standard that uh, you aspire to, or that you agree to at CASA? Not that we aspire to. That, but that you would. Uh, Again, under the circumstances, condone. You describe a situation that does not sound very nice for the animal. Absolutely. And if that place has been accredited by you, would that be? That would be a concern. concern? That would Absolutely. Be able, uh, that would be concerning. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Pletcher and Councillor Burnside. You are next. Uh, thank you. Um, through you. So, in terms of this prohibited list, you you mentioned that your concern is that it would drive this uh, industry, if you will, underground on some level? Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. Um, but then you also talked about exceptions if they were accredited by yourself, correct? Or by your organization? Right. Okay. So I'm just trying to understand, um, are you saying go ahead with the list but make exceptions, exceptions if they're accredited? Yes. I, I, what we're saying is that the City of Toronto absolutely has the right to, to identify animals that under any circumstances they wouldn't consider. Well, no, I understand our rights, but I'm just trying to understand. So you're saying, okay, it's okay to do the prohibited list, but there should be um, an allowance for exceptions if someone is accredited by your organization. That's right. Okay. How does that not still put uh, the industry underground, though? Because if they're not accredited by your organization and it's prohibited, they still go underground. Well, if, in fact, you go the extra step, which would require any organization that's doing these kind of programming to be, have a license and, and then operate in compliance with accreditation such as we, we provide, then that would provide some, some above-ground supervision of that. Uh, absolutely. You need to continue my, my to hammer down on those who are doing this kind of out of their I'm, basement. I'm still trying to understand this whole issue, but, my, but if you say, okay, you need 
uh, there's a prohibited list. Well, I don't think those people that are going underground are going to apply for a license. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, I don't know how you can have both. Yeah, you need to do both. Yeah, absolutely, you've got to do enforcement. That's part of what uh, the city needs to be doing. The OSBCA needs to be doing as well. What we're on the lookout for as well, where we see circumstances where, where people are putting an, using animals in an untoward way, we absolutely bring that to, to attention, whether that's a member or, or just a, a, another fly-by-night operation that we come across. We should all be concerned about that. Okay, it's still not clear to me, but that's fine. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Burnside. The Deputy Mayor, you're the next one. Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. If an organization, I, I happen to sit on the Toronto Zoo board, so that's a completely different uh, creature, we'll call it. But if one of these smaller uh, uh, businesses that have one full-time staff member, or it's just a sanctuary that has no full-time staff members, could they, in theory, apply to CASA and get accredited? Uh, if they were able to demonstrate compliance with all of our accreditation standards, possibly could. The way you describe it there, I can't imagine it'd be, it'd be tough to do, but um, if they could demonstrate compliance, that's the, it, as long as they can meet the standards, that's the most right. important thing. So, so if I meet certain standards of care, um, say I could have some reptiles in my garage, I could apply to CASA and get an accreditation uh, you if I meet the standard of care. You, if you were up in any garage, you would not be meeting CASA standards, I can guarantee you. Because because it's very unlikely that they're going to be able to provide the, the level of care for that animal out of your garage. Okay. And for an organization that does um, uh, get accredited, mm -hmm. how often are your inspections of their premises, roughly? Every, every five years. Every five years. So if I uh, got accredited tomorrow with a good standard of care, with the appropriate conditions, you would say, great, Glenn, here you go, we'll see you in five years. That's right. Okay. We're, we're monitoring, constantly monitoring uh, the operations on a drop-by basis, but in terms of formal inspection of every five years. Okay. And then ju just one other quick question, Mr. Chair. In terms of, of um, say, uh, John's um, business and my business, if we're running roughly the same business, I'm accredited, he's not. The only way then we'd be able to tell is we would have to, in, you know, find John and find Glenn, their two businesses. He uh, has accreditation and I don't. So it would really be a call to CASA to say, is this business registered with you? And you would say yes. And he'd say, is this other one registered? And you would say no. And we would say, when was the last time that you were at Mr. Burnside's business? You might say three years ago. But he is accredited. He would have met your standard. Right. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, is Vice Chair Kajanis, you're next. Thank you, Chair, through you to the Deputy, and thank you very much for coming this morning. When I was in grade seven and eight, um, this was in Essex Public School, at the back of the, uh, the science class, the, um, our science teacher used to have exotic animals. He even had a, uh, a reptile, I can't remember if it was a boa constrictor or an anaconda, but you know, there was all kinds of animals. And, and we, grew, you know, seven and eight, when we used to go and take care of the animals and, and make sure that they were looked after. How would this in today's standards, how does that fit in with your, with your and how you will classify the classroom that has a, a couple of exotic birds in the science lab that ch children can work with, be there for? The, the circumstance you described does not sound like it would meet a certain threshold of standard, that's for sure. One of the right, most... Chair, I got a hard time of really hearing the difference. Please, uh, let's be a little bit quiet so we can hear the, Thank you the questions and the answers. It. Sorry about so that. Ahead. Thank you. Uh, one of the fundamental differences is that if you're CASA accredited, you need to be, your animals must uh, be under regular supervision of, of a veterinarian. So, um, as a, for instance, every two weeks, if, at Calgary Zoo, we have vet, two veterinarians full-time on staff working with the animals every day. But in, in any circumstance, any credit to, credit to, credited institution has, has to have uh, a visit from a vet every two weeks, uh, which I dare say if everyone who had a pet uh, had a vet take a look at their animals every two weeks, the, the health of welfare of their animal would be increased uh, dramatically. So the, the situation you're describing doesn't sound like it would kind of qualify uh, for a level of accreditation. 
But that's the, that's the reality that so many animals live with. It's, it's in people's basements, in their garages. No, uh, but I'm talking about the back of a classroom. I'm talking about a, a teacher, yeah. a science teacher. I can't remember who was. Well-meaning, yes. You know, uh, is, yeah. there, is there anything that exists like that today? I mean, that you know of in, in any schools? Uh, um, animals that are, the kids look after? Um, it, it's, a, it's a question that is, that is really open. How do, how do you ensure the welfare of the animals that, that we have in our care? Uh, and they're everywhere. They're not just our pets, but you're right there in the back of the schools. Uh, lots of people have exotic pets now as, as animals, and their ability to provide adequate care and welfare for would, them. Would a, a rabbit in, in a kindergarten class be classified as an exotic pet? No. Would a... Uh, I don't think you'll have enough money to buy a kangaroo. Would a guinea pig classify as an exotic pet? Pro probably not. I mean, we're, the, dis the discussion what is, is around what's reasonable in the classroom, exactly. the kindergarten classroom, or not. That's the, the, not question, the question isn't, isn't whether it's, it's exotic or not. That classification is somewhat arbitrary anyways. Exotic means it, maybe it comes from a, a different continent or something like that. But the, the real question is, do we, does the person who has the care of that animal have the capability, the knowledge, of, and the ability to care for it effectively? That's the fundamental question. Okay. I thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. Any other questions? If not, thanks so much for your presentation. Thank you.